We are continuing our series on the Holy Spirit. This morning we're looking today at the Holy Spirit and the world. Uh, we're, we're, we've been taking kind of a, a, a you could say a bird's eye view. Uh, 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 we've been taking kind of a, a big view of the operation and nature of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is our last one today that we're going to be doing on this, uh, taking that kind of an approach. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at regeneration, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, fullness of the Holy Spirit, and uh, more specific things along those, along those lines, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, uh, and so on. So, thank you for bearing with us and, and uh, getting to uh, understand uh, these things. Really, these past few weeks, including today, are really the foundation for those other uh, weeks to come because um, in, in you know, speaking about, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the fullness of the Holy Spirit, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, things along, that, along those lines, uh, you're assuming a lot. You're assuming all of the things that we're, we've been covering these past few weeks. And so uh, we're really just laying a, a foundation for the weeks to come. We're going to be, you're going to notice we're going to be constantly referring back to principles and uh, realities, truths that we've already been covering. So uh, this morning we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit and the world, a, a topic not often covered when you cover pneumatology. I think it's important for us uh, to wrap our minds around this aspect uh, to help guard us from error in other areas. Now, let me go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand your word, help us to understand who you are, God, uh, as uh, the triune God, that we would relate to you correctly, that we would know our God uh, in all his persons, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we would know each of you, God. We pray for your help. We pray for your illumination of your Holy Spirit, that he would enable us to understand, perceive, uh, submit to, uh, value, and live out these, these uh, scriptures that we're looking at today. We pray, Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit would Come and uh, enable us to rightly divide the Word of God. Help me to present it in an understandable and helpful way. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So again, today we're looking at the Holy Spirit and the world. The Holy Spirit and the world. And specifically, we are thinking about today uh, the the realm of common grace. So when we think about the common grace of God, uh, how does the Holy Spirit communicate the common grace of God to an unbelieving world? Uh, we know from Scripture that there are, you could classify um, the grace of God, the unmerited favor and kindness of God, is classified in, in two sections. One is common grace, and the other is special grace. Special grace op is the operation of God to, for example, uh, save a sinner, to uh, regenerate a heart. We're going to be looking at that next week, the special grace of God. Special grace of God is seen in the church, and the operation of God uh, uh, illuminating the word to us, uh, working in us in, in a special way as his people. But what about the rest of the world? Does the, does the rest of the unbelieving world benefit in some measure from the grace of God, from the, just a general kindness of God? Yes, of course. As Christ said uh, in the scriptures that uh, the Father, God, uh, causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. So that's common grace. So we're going to be looking at specifically the operation of the Holy Spirit when it comes to common grace. 
Um, John 15, just to kind of lay the groundwork here for today, to set the table. John 15, verse 26 and 27 says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will bear witness also, because you have been with me from the beginning. We're going to be looking at the theme that this, one of the themes that this verse introduces. And that is that the Holy Spirit is a witness bearer. He bears witness of Christ. But in verse 27, uh, there's a connection that, is, that, that might be overlooked. And that is, and you will bear witness also. So Christ is promising the coming of the Holy Spirit upon his departure. The Holy Spirit will be sent by Christ from the Father to the church, to the people of God. He will indwell us. He will live within us. And as Christ leaves this world, the function or the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bear witness of Christ. But notice that it's not just him that's bearing witness. It is us also, his disciples, his, the followers of Christ. We, along with the Holy Spirit, bear witness of Jesus Christ. So we testify, we, we witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the glories of Christ. And we're going to look at the details of that today. We bear witness along with the Holy Spirit. Or it could be said, I would say, that the Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ through the church. So we are the vehicles of the common grace of God to this world. Christ said, you are salt and light of the world, right? This is how it's done. It's the Holy Spirit of God operating in and through us to dispense a common grace of testifying of Christ to an unbelieving world and to the truth of, of Scripture. So first of all, how does this happen? Well, first of all, he reveals. He reveals. The Holy Spirit reveals truth. He reveals truth. And you could uh, think of this, and Scripture presents this revelation of God as light. So when the Holy Spirit reveals the way he has revealed is through the scriptures. And the scriptures, this revelation, is called light. It's the light of revelation. Now we understand that apart from the light of revelation, we and this world would remain in complete darkness. We would remain in complete darkness. We get this from verses like Psalm 119 Verse 105, the, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God, revelation, the scriptures, is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. Uh, also in Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is is light. There's those same two words again. The commandment is a lamp and, and the law is light. This is the function of the Bible in this world. It is a lamp and a light in a dark, dark world. If God doesn't light our path with the light of his word, then we would beware. We would be, still be stumbling around in the darkness of sin, wouldn't we? That's why the word is called light. Because when it reveals God, it is like this bright light in a dark place. 
and he uh, illumines our minds. And this is part of special grace. He illumines our minds as believers to see and perceive the light, to see it as light, and to utilize it for our path. Now, this revelation of God, this light, is by the Holy Spirit. So it is a revelation that is by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible, just to put it plainly, the Bible comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And we get this from many passages, but probably the best one is passage in 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. It says, it says this, Know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes by one owns interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the will of man. <clears throat> Excuse me. But men, being moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. So this isn't a lesson on the inspiration of Scripture, so I'm not going to go into much depth here. We're not going to linger here very long. But we can simply state as fact that all of Scripture comes from God by the Holy Spirit. Notice you have all of these elements from God, and specifically that's God the Father, or you could say the triune God, generally speaking, the, because the, every person of the Trinity is, is active and uh, involved and in working in harmony in this work of revelation. But specifically, God the Father speaks, and, and He speaks by the Holy Spirit. He speaks to us by the Holy Spirit. But it is through men. It is men being moved, right? Men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So he traces it. He traces the scripture and says it's, it's from men, but those men are moved by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks from God. So the Holy Spirit takes the truths of the Father, and he relays it to us through human vessels, now, the New Testament and the Old Testament both give credit to the Spirit of God uh, for all of Revelation. 2 Samuel 23 uh, says, Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, The man who was raised on high declares, The anointed of the God of Jacob and, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. That's the introductory. And here's what he declares. He says, the spirit of Yahweh spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So he's saying, when I spoke or when I wrote down scripture, the Psalms that we have, that is the word of God. That's the very word of God. He spoke uh, by or through David. And notice it is the Spirit of Yahweh who spoke through David. Specifically, the Holy Spirit spoke through David. And he says, His word was on my tongue. So when David spoke uh, this revelation, uh, it was not David's words, but whose words? God's. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of Yahweh's words. What were the words that were on the tongue of David? Now, this was uh, the promise as well given by Christ to the disciples that uh, just as it has been going on uh, since the Old Testament, just as the word of God was on the tongue of the, uh, of the psalmist David, that that ministry would continue. Uh, and the spirit of truth would come upon them. 
So this, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. As Christ would leave his earthly ministry, he promises the disciples that they would receive the Spirit of Truth. Notice how he's spoken of in this way in John 14 and John 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that he may be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. You know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. And then later on in verse 26 of John 14, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, All things. Who is this? The spirit of truth will teach you. So what will he teach you? He'll teach you truth. He will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And then later on in that evening, uh, in John 16, verse 13, Christ says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. So this sounds a lot like 2 Samuel. This sounds a lot like 2 Peter, doesn't it? That God will speak and and reveal truth to uh, a human vessel. And he will speak by his Holy Spirit through men. The Spirit of truth will come and he will guide these apostles into all the truth. He will take from the Father. He will not speak from uh, himself. But he will take whatever he hears from the Father and he will speak it to them and teach them and he will disclose to them what is to come. That's prophecy. That's prophecy. And so we see that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the result is now we have the New Testament. We have Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But to us... This is Paul speaking, and he's speaking as an apostle, as an author of of the New Testament scriptures. He says, but to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. What's the them? It's the things of God. It's the wisdom of God, the truth of God in the context before in chapter 2. So to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. Notice, Notice the mediation. God the Father, through the Spirit again, because the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So, from God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, to these men who would write Scripture, and that's how we get the New Testament. That's how we get all of Scripture. So, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He he has come to reveal truth. He has come to reveal God himself in Scripture. Now, uh, one author writes this, Thomas Brooks. He says, The Spirit teaches the saints all things. What does that mean? He says, One, He teaches them all things needful for the salvation of their souls. That is, all things necessary to bring them to heaven. Second, He teaches them all things needful to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 Third, the Holy Spirit teaches them all things needful to their places, callings, genders, ages, and conditions. Fourth, he teaches them all things needful for you to know to, in order to preserve you in the truth and to preserve you from being deluded and seduced by those false teachers. So that is what's included in the all things. All things necessary for life and godliness. All things needed for salvation. All things needed for daily conduct in all situations. And all things to guard you from falsehood. That's what this Holy Spirit has revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. He's given man everything that we could ever need to know in the pages of Scripture when it comes to life and godliness. Now, the Holy Spirit reveals truth, or He has revealed truth in the pages of Scripture. But He also 
testifies to that truth in the world. So secondly, this morning, he testifies. He testifies. Now, we've been looking at this, and and this theme has been coming up as we've been looking at the operation of the Holy Spirit over the past few weeks. we've, We've noticed that the main vehicle of ministry for the Holy Spirit is the vehicle of words. The Holy Spirit's ministry is is mainly a speaking kind of ministry. It is a testifying ministry. It's a ministry of truth. So as we think about the testifying of the Holy Spirit, we, we understand that this is a central uh, mark or designation of his ministry in this world. He testifies of truth. Now, of course, he testifies of Christ first and foremost. It says in Acts 5, this one God exalted to his right hand as a leader and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God gave to those who obey him. Notice, as we looked at uh, in in, uh, John 15, we are witnesses and so is the Holy Spirit. Both us as Christians, as the church, we witness of Christ. Notice the content of of what we testify of, the content of our witnessing is this one, right? This one whom God exalted to is is, is Christ. We are witnesses of Christ, and so is the Holy Spirit. He testifies through the church. How amazing that we as a church bear witness of this one. And how stunning on top of that, that the Holy Spirit testifies along with us. So Christian, this means that when you share the gospel with somebody, the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. That should give you confidence and courage and boldness to just open your mouth and speak. Because when you speak, it's not you. Of course, it's you speaking, but, but in, in a sense, it's, it's not just you. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through you, dispensing the grace of the truth of God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ through your efforts. And because this is under the umbrella of common grace, Because this is under the umbrella of common grace, this testifying does not automatically produce belief. Right? So as you testify of Christ, not everybody that you speak to becomes saved. Right? Not everybody that you talk to just says, all right, I'm in. You know, I believe. I mean, it's it's more often than not that they don't, that they reject the gospel of Christ. That belief, that acceptance of the testimony of the Holy Spirit, that's a work of special grace or regeneration. That's what we're going to look at next week. So what we understand is though the Holy Spirit testifies, that testimony meets resistance. It does, it 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 is opposed. It can be rejected, this common testifying, just the, the, the general call, it's called. The theologians call this the general call of the gospel or the common grace of revelation. We see that it can be resisted, for example, in Acts 7, where it says, you, you men, stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, 
you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Notice that they're, what they're resisting. They are resisting a person. They're resisting the Holy Spirit. So when someone rejects the word of God, Christian, don't take it personal. They're not resisting you. They're resisting the spirit and his testimony through you. you your job is just to be faithful and to testify and to bear witness of Christ. And nothing is new under the sun, right? Just as the Old Testament uh, Israel were stiff-necked, that is stubborn, right? That's what stiff-necked means. I mean, we've all seen that in, in kids where they become stiff-necked and they just refuse to, to, to uh, bend to your will as a parent. That stubbornness is stiff-necked. And uncircumcised in heart, that is you are dull and unsensitive, you are still unclean in heart and ears. So a heart uh, and a mind that rejects the truth of God, ears that uh, just turn a deaf ear to the truth of God, that is resisting God. And uh, I believe it's Peter here in context. Uh, he says, as your fathers did, so do you. As Old Testament Israel did uh, resist the Holy Spirit, well, how did they resist? When did they resist? Well, it was when all the prophets would speak. It was when Moses would speak on behalf of God. It was when David would speak on behalf of God. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. When, when these men of God would come to the people of God and and prophesy or testify the truth of God and their need of repentance. They rejected these people, right? But the reality is they, re they were resisting the Holy Spirit. That, was, that is what was happening behind the scenes, you could say. Though they were rejecting these men and their ministry, they weren't being rejected. It was the Holy Spirit and His truth. So, we see that the Holy Spirit, He has revealed truth in the Word of God, and then He testifies to that truth, that is, through, uh, through, through us, through our witnessing, through our bearing witness, through our words, He testifies to that truth in our testifying. But not only that, another work of the common grace of God by the Holy Spirit is that he convicts. He convicts the world, the world regarding that truth. So he reveals the truth, he testifies about the truth, and then he convicts regarding that, that truth that he just testified of. So he convicts. You see, the, the reality is that apart from God's common grace, man's total depravity, our sinfulness, would swell up, as it were, into an overwhelming kind of tidal wave of wickedness. If it was not for God... Uh, I have the wrong slide there. Uh, you can put there under three, he convicts. You can put, uh, it is an effect on the unbelieving world. An effect on the unbelieving world. Christ, at the end of his life, promises that the Holy Spirit would come and live in believers. And he would take up residence in the church. And through the church, he would have an effect on this world. Uh, John 16, verse 8 to 11. And he, when he comes, will convict the world. There's our word. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. 
concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So the effect that the Holy Spirit has on the world is one of conviction. Now that word convict or conviction, it means to expose and or rebuke. To expose and or rebuke. The, the, the base meaning, the fundamental core meaning of this word, you could say, is to expose or that is to bring to light. To bring to light. And it carries along this, this, this additional idea of rebuke because why do you bring something to light? Why do you uh, expose uh, especially a fault? Well, it's to rebuke the person for that fault. So it is to expose, to bring to light, and then rebuke. So that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit towards unbelievers. For believers, this is just the very beginning of his work, right? This is just the very beginning of his working of grace in our heart. You are convicted of your sin, right? You didn't, I, I hope you didn't come to Jesus because it was a good financial decision or because he had nothing better going on or whatever else, what other trite reason. You come to Christ because you're convicted over your sin. Because Christ is the only refuge from the wrath of God. That's why you come to Christ. And you come to him because he is, he is beautiful in your sight. Because you see the sinfulness of yourself and the wickedness, wickedness of your own heart. And you look outside of yourself and you, see, you behold Christ in his glory and you are drawn to him because of his love for you. And the first element of that work and part of the just common grace of God is that the Holy Spirit, through us, mind you, through us and through his word, convicts the world. Now, he, he parses it down, Christ parses it down into three elements or three things uh, that the Holy Spirit convicts about. And they're just right there in the text. Concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. Those are the three uh, blanks there on your notes. Concerning sin, concerning righteousness, concerning judgment. Now, first of all, concerning sin. Concerning sin, uh, the word sin there is singular. It's singular. And it is, it's the idea of the sin, the, the, the primary sin. And we know that the primary sin is, is and, and the most wicked sin, is a rejection of Christ, right? We, we don't, go to hell just because we reject Christ. But of all the sins that we are, are judged for, that is the most heinous. The unbelief of the heart towards Christ needs to be pointed out to believers. Right? And that's what he says concerning sin because they do not believe in me. That's the central focus. That's the central focus and, and, and the prime, you could say, sin that just caps all other sins off is the sin of unbelief. It's the rejection of Christ. Uh, secondly, he says, concerning righteousness. Concerning righteousness. Now, as concerning righteousness, he says, because... I go to the Father and you no longer see me. What he's saying is, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning, for, for this one, he will convict the world concerning righteousness. Why does the Holy Spirit convict the world concerning righteousness? Jesus says, well, the reason is because I go to the Father 
and you no longer see me. The, the idea here is, since Christ was leaving this earth, right? That's the historical context. Since Christ was leaving this earth, his display, his life of righteousness would no longer be seen, right? His perfect life was a testimony, was a display of pure righteousness, perfection. And Jesus says, well, that is leaving. That perfect display of righteousness is leaving. And, and didn't Christ say that uh, the unbeliever uh, loves the dark, or excuse me, hates the light because he loves the darkness, right? The reason why there's a hatred towards Christ in his earthly ministry is because of his perfection. He was a walking light in this world. And what, what's the operation of that light, he says in John 3? It's their deeds are exposed. There's the exposing of sin. That's conviction. That's what the word means. So the righteous, perfect life of Christ was a light that exposed the sin of those around him. And he says, now that that is leaving, the Holy Spirit comes to do what my life was doing the whole time, to, conf to convict concerning righteousness. The Holy, the Holy Spirit comes to bring that conviction regarding righteousness and specifically our lack of that righteousness and our wickedness in light of that righteousness. He comes to bring that conviction in Christ's absence. That's the point. Third, he says, concerning judgment. Concerning judgment. Because why does the Holy Spirit need to convict concerning judgment? That is, why does the Holy Spirit need to uh, bring to light and rebuke our sin concerning judgment? Well, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Follow with me here. Since Satan has already been defeated at the cross and he awaits that final sentencing in the end times, therefore, the Holy Spirit comes to convict concerning judgment. For now, in this world, in this time, Satan rules this world as the prince of the power of the air, holding his sway over the world and its systems. So it doesn't look like Satan is judged. It doesn't look like uh, Satan is, is uh, uh, defeated. Therefore, the Holy Spirit comes to convict concerning judgment because it doesn't look like sin is judged. Does that make sense? You look, you look out in this world, you look uh, out at those around you, you look at uh, the headlines, you look at uh, society, it doesn't look like the normal operation of the world is that sin uh, earns judgment. It looks like sin is applauded and promoted. And the more sinful you are, the more prosperous you are. That's what it looks like at times. Therefore, the Holy Spirit must come to convict regarding judgment. The Holy Spirit, in his ministry of conviction, warns unbelievers that the doom of their master, Satan, will be soon their own doom if they do not repent and believe in Christ. That's the operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Ralph Robinson, an English Puritan, says this. Conviction of sin is the first work of the, Holy Sp uh, of the Spirit of God, John 16, 8. 
He is a convincing, or you could say convicting, it's, it's the same word. He is a convincing before he is a comforting spirit. So before the Holy Spirit, in his operation of special grace, of comforting the sinner with the gospel, he first convicts regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. So it is his first work. That is, it's the first thing that he does in someone's heart and mind if he is to save them. He first convicts, and then he brings the comfort of the gospel. And he concludes then, Robinson concludes, you must give the ministers of Christ leave to set sin upon the conscience. What does he mean? You must allow preachers and ministers of the gospel, give them room. Don't fight them. Don't rail against them as they set sin upon the conscience. That is, let preachers convict. Right? Let a, a preacher of the word of God, if this is the first work of the Holy Spirit, and if you want the gospel, the, the preacher must first convict of sin and show the need of the gospel. Amen. And this is, this is a model for all of us, right? You don't just approach somebody and say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Because he doesn't. If they're an unbeliever. The only person that can receive those words is someone who has already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God loves you, Christian, and has a wonderful plan for your life, Christian. It's only true of us. And that wonderful plan may mean suffering. But if Christ is with us, it's wonderful, isn't it? But for the unbeliever, you don't tell them. You don't just give them the comforting words of the gospel right out the gate. How do they know that they even need? Why, why do they need saving? Why go to Christ? Why seek refuge in him? If there's no danger. Yes. That's why it's important when you're witnessing to somebody that you give them the bad news instead of the good news first, right? They yeah. know what's, what's hindering them from having that right relationship and that forgiveness if they don't know what sin is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, brother said that's why when we witness of Christ, we give them the bad news first and the, before we give them the good news. In order for the good news to be really good, you have to know it has to be set on a backdrop of, of reality, right? It, it's, it's been described as uh, the, the, the jewel of the gospel is like a diamond, and what do you do if you've ever gone uh, diamond shopping, if you've ever gone jewelry shopping or shopping for a ring, uh, you've seen this. Uh, you can pick out the, the setting, you can pick out the ring, but, but you also have to pick out the diamond. And when you go to the jewelry store, what they'll do is they'll open up uh, or roll out this velvet mat. And that mat is pitch black. And it's velvet. It's a certain material because it doesn't reflect light. It just absorbs light. And what happens is they take out that diamond and they set it on top of that black mat. And the only thing that shines is the diamond. That is our presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must set out the black mat if you are ever going to do the diamond justice, you see. If a jeweler just, you know, pulls out uh, a mirror or if he pulls out a white piece of paper and sets a diamond, you're not going to appreciate what's before you. It's just going to look like a pebble. Uh, he goes on, Ralph Robinson goes on, the fallow ground must be broken up before the seed of comfort is cast in. A sin convincing or convicting ministry is most likely to be a soul converting ministry. And that's what we want, isn't it? We want the conversion of souls. 
And, and, and Robinson, in his wisdom, because he knows the word of God, right? Uh, he says, you know what? If you want to be a most successful at soul conversion, you have to first be successful at soul convicting. He says, you know, when you plant a garden, you don't just take a seed and just throw it on the dirt, right? You break up the dirt first, and then you throw the seed. So it is with the sinful, hard heart of man. It must be broken up by conviction so that you can actually cast in the seed of the gospel. Now, the question is, does the Holy Spirit do this convicting work at times without ending up in salvation? The answer is yes. Yes, he does. Because, again, this is a work of common grace. It's a work of common grace. Now, this is sobering. Because somebody can be convicted over their sin but never saved. They can feel bad, and there can be tears, but never saved. Yes? Salvation comes through special revelation, right? Uh, Special grace. grace. Yes. Yes. Salvation, which is the comforting of ministry of the Holy Spirit, that's the work of special grace. This is the work of common grace. Now, in the work of special, yes. Um, so, um, is special revelation and general revelation different from common grace and common revelation? Special revelation. I mean? um, there's. It, so the question is: Is general revelation and special revelation the same thing as common, common, grace. common grace and special grace? Uh, No, they're two different things. So uh, there's some overlap. Uh, There's, you know, things that they share, as it were, but they are two separate things. So general revelation is just what we know about God, because that's revelation. Revelation is knowledge of God. So general revelation is what we can know about God from nature and history and, and just in general Uh, creation. Special revelation is where God spoke, right? Um, uh, Common grace is uh, uh, just the common kindness of God, and special grace is the special kindness he has just for the elect, his people. Yeah. Does that get it for you? Another question or thought? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where there's overlap. So it's, um, so the work of general revelation is a work of the common grace of God, right? So there is overlap there, but they are two separate things because there's revelation and there's grace, right? That's knowledge about God and the kindness of God, right? So those are two separate things, but they do overlap in the same, you could say, event or situation. Yeah. Good. Uh, It's good to clarify and crystallize those things in our minds. Any other questions or thoughts? You can interrupt me at any point just to make make clear. Okay, so this is a work of common grace. Conviction can be a work of common grace. It can also be the beginnings of a work of special grace. Right, because we must be convicted of our sins to run to Christ for salvation. Right? So it can be the beginnings of, of special grace, but in and of itself, just conviction is a work of common grace. It, it is an act of God's kindness even to an unbeliever who remains an unbeliever. One illustration of this is the illustration that Christ gives the parable of the sower. 
He says in Mark 4, and this is also found in Matthew 13 and Luke 8. But here I want to look at Mark 4 because it's a little more uh, just simple and straightforward to the point. Mark 4, 2 to 8 says, He was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And it happened that as he was sowing, that is spreading some seed, some seed fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate it up. And the other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up because it had, because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun rose, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And other seeds fell into the good soil. And as they grew up and, in, and increased, they were yielding a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we see here in the uh, first uh, three soils, where the soil uh, just falls on the road where the soil goes uh, in rocky soil, shallow ground, and the, and, and the soil where the seed fell on uh, a thorny soil. Uh, those three soils are the work of the common grace of God, where it's just a common you know, dispensing of the word of God. And that happens every Sunday, doesn't it? Where, where you know, the preacher stands up to preach and you just have a mix of all different kinds of people, believers, unbelievers, um, and all different kinds of unbelievers. Now, the, the most common uh, response is the first response, where, there's, uh, where it just falls on the side of the road, where somebody just sits in a, in a, under the teaching of the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God, and just survives the lesson, survives the sermon, and just is more concerned about other things, and just uh, nothing got through. There's no response there. And that's probably the most common response when it comes to unbelievers. Second response is uh, where it fell on rocky ground and it did not have much soil. But notice that there is a response. He says it immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And the sun rose and it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And Christ uh, says here uh, that it, it, it actually sprang up. So there was um, some visible, apparent response. And the same thing with the one that fell among the thorns. It, it, it came up. The uh, the, uh, and other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and, it, and choked it. So there's a response there, that this seed uh, springs up, but so do the thorns along with it. So in both of these cases, uh, you have the word of God, the common grace of God going out. Uh, and there seems to be some response. That's conviction. That's conviction. Where maybe they feel bad about what they did. They realize that, you know, my life is in shambles. I'm not comfortable here. Seems like what these guys are offering has some sort of answer. I really like being around Christians. They're really nice. Uh, I feel like I belong here. I feel good here. What, whatever the response is. And the response could be, you know, there's varying degrees to this, right? I mean, the response could be all the, all the way to the point of they're baptized and they become a member of a church, right? Because they look like the rest of, of the seeds that spring up. The response can go all, all the way to there. But, he says, as he explains in the rest of, of uh, the passage, there's a point where they fall away. There's a point 
where the, the, the growth stops. And whether it's by trials or persecution or just the cares of the world and the temptations of sin pulls that one away and they yield no crop. They yield no crop. There's no true life there. Though it might look like it for a while. That is the work of the common grace of God in the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, uh, what's our response to that reality? Well, our response is not to go out and try and figure out who's the wheat and who's the tare, right? Because Christ says that there will always be tares among the wheat. It has to be that way. There will always be unbelievers in a church. Why? It's to keep you on your toes, Christian. It's to keep you uh, uh, guarding against your own sinfulness. When you see uh, someone who you thought was a believer just, just abandon the faith, your response should be to cling all the more tightly to Christ. Amen. That's why it must be so. That's how we benefit. But the world also benefits from the testimony and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit through the church in that evil is restrained. And uh, we're ending here. Evil is restrained. The effect of this revealing, testifying, and convicting work of the Holy Spirit in the unbelieving world Remember, this, we're talking specifically common grace to an unbelieving world who stays unbelieving. There is still an effect of this convicting work, and that is that evil is restrained. That is why, uh, though we are totally depraved, though sinful man is totally depraved, that's why we're not as bad as we could be. Because there is a restraining work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 6 and 7. And you know what restrains him now. Now that him is the man of lawlessness. You know what restrains him, the man of lawless, lawlessness now. So that in his time he will be revealed. So there is a coming a time when the man of lawlessness uh, will be revealed. That is the, the Antichrist. What it seems to be in scripture. And he says, but, but even now, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So the man of lawlessness that, that typifies rebellion against God is yet to be revealed. But still today, there's that spirit of lawlessness, that mystery of lawlessness that's operating in the world today. It's the same uh, mantra. It's the same... Um, uh, godless uh, rebellion, but it's not typified in a person yet, but yet it is still operational in the world. Mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's already happening. So what's happening now? Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So we see here, that there is lawlessness happening in the world, but there is also a restraining happening in the world at the same time. So though there is a spirit of lawlessness in every man, there is total depravity. Every part and aspect of man is affected and corrupted and destroyed, in a sense, by sin. Though that's true, why are we not as bad as we could be. Why, why, is not, why is it that every human being that is an unbeliever is not a Hitler or a Stalin? Why is that so? Because there is one who is restraining right now. There is one who is restraining. And this is, I believe, the Holy Spirit restraining sin Restraining lawlessness through the testimony of the church. And he says there is a point when 
uh, he will be taken out of the way. I take this to mean that at the rapture of the church, the church will be taken away, and the main operation of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church will be taken away because the church is taken away. And now the restraining influence of the church, the spirit through the church, is now gone, and the man of lawlessness has just free reign in this world. And that will happen in the tribulation. So, what holds the evil wickedness of sin back from bursting forth into just utter chaos? It is God's common grace through the Holy Spirit. And in this age, that common grace is done through the church, the temple of the living God. So Christian, that means when you see evil, you need to call it evil. When you see sin, you call it sin. That means that you should be holy as God is holy. Why? Because he is operating, part of it is because he is operating his common grace to this world through you. Your holiness is the grace of God in this world. That's just one aspect of it. Let alone it's a better life. A holy life is a better life, trust me. A Christ-like life is a better life than you trying to do things on your own. But here we see it is a work of the common grace of God in this world. You're a light. Be a light, Christian. So we see that the Holy Spirit is living and active in the world today. Having revealed God's truth in the Scriptures, He now testifies to that truth and convicts the world of that truth through us, the church. So let us be a strong church to hold up the light of the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ in this dark world. Amen? Amen. Next week, we're going to be looking, starting to be, look at the specifics of the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in the life of the believer. We're going to be looking at regeneration and indwelling. It should be a super encouraging time for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you that you have sent him into this world, into the church, into our own hearts, Lord. And he comes to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, and, and, and us too, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do that. Convict us of our own sin, and convict uh, through our speaking and through our testifying and and just through our living even. May you do a convicting work on those around us. May they see something different about our lives from theirs. And may, may it be like a light upon their wicked deeds so that they would be convicted of their sin and the needfulness of, of their salvation. And they would come and we would ask, and they would ask, what is different about you? And they would come and ask uh, uh, about the conviction that they're feeling and we would be ready to give them the, the comforting words of the gospel. Oh Lord, do this work through the church. Do this work through each of us individually so that Christ may be exalted. And that's the purpose of this all. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.